I can still hear the music. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for waiting and for folks that have been with us um, uh, all day long. <laughs> thank you so much for sticking with us. It has been um, a really incredible day um, getting to share everything I know with the amazing team um, that I've had the, the great honor to work with these past few years, share all of their brilliance and, and everything that they have done and innovated and learned. Um, this cycle through our programs with all of you. I hope you feel the same. If you missed any of the sessions earlier today, they are all gonna be available as recordings on um, a website we popped up just for this community, um, acronymplaybook.com. There's already a bunch of our case studies and learnings and materials there now for you guys to dig into. Um, and these sessions will also be there later this week. So thank you guys so much for being here. I'm just gonna give a little bit of an intro to this conversation, which I've been looking forward to for a long time. Um, I, what I, I was hoping to do today is bring on uh, David Pluff, who really needs no introduction, but has been such a generous friend and mentor and colleague um, to myself and the whole team at Acronym uh, these past few years. Uh, he was a political hero of mine long before I met him, uh, a little under two years ago, and I continue to learn so much from him and am so, so grateful that he has decided to join us to share um, some of his insights with all of you. Um, the topic of our conversation today is going to be taking risks. Um, and uh, there are a few people that, that know the, the need, um, the critical need to do that and to create the space for that um, in our politics and in campaigns in order to win. And and so um, I, David figuratively and literally wrote the book on it. He is the former campaign manager and senior advisor uh, to President Obama. And, uh, and also uh, more recently last year wrote and published the book, uh, Citizen's Guide to Beating Donald Trump, which is a title that aged very well. I'm excited to talk about that um, and, uh, and, and have him um, share some of his reflections on this past election. So David, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've had a really great engaging audience from all across the country and world. We've had some folks from New Zealand and the UK um, chime in with questions and learn from, from our playbook this cycle. So thanks so much for being here. It's awesome to be with you, Tara. I hope our guests from New Zealand uh, gave us some of their thoughts on how to properly handle the coronavirus, which we're starting to do finally in the last week. But anyway, it's great to be with you and I'm sure it's been a great session so far. And I'm as eager to... Um, you know, hear your thoughts uh, as I am to share, you know, any observations I have, but let's jump into it. Yeah, so I want to start before, I, I definitely want to get to actually talking about the state of politics today, um, but I know that we will get to a somewhat sobering place as we tend to do because of the state of our politics, even though we have a lot more to be hopeful about right now. But before we do that, I do want to, um, I do want to take a look back. We have spent most of the day um, really digging into the program work that we've done. We've gotten really into the weeds on tactics and strategies and testing and everything. But um, I want to, um, you left, you, you were in politics for a long time. You really changed the political playbook um, in many ways, as did uh, your candidate and our former president, President Obama. And that's certainly where I came up in politics. Um, and I think we probably have a lot of people on the line who actually came into politics because of Trump. So on the opposite side, or for opposite reasons, I should say. Um, and, 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 and so you had left though, after uh, the Obama years, and then you made a decision to come come back. And I had not met you until this point of time, but I would really love to hear, um, as I'm sure others would on this call, what made you come back? And also, what made you um, comfortable and willing, or I hope excited to, to take a chance on an, on an outside and very little known group? called Acronym, um, and founder me, who was really, um, you know, outside of the establishment groups that really do drive a lot of this work. Well, Tara, first I'll start on the latter. I mean, I think uh, I, um, from a distance, saw what you had stood up and did in 2018. I was very impressed by it. Um, and if you look at Courier, which I'm sure we'll talk about the news properties that you've stood up, uh, the type of 
both boosting of existing content, which I know you talked on, on earlier panels, but advertising that didn't look like political advertising that was risky, um, that was authentic. Um, you know, to me, it was exciting because I thought that's what it would take. I mean, every election generally comes down to a small percentage of swing voters who are pretty disinterested in politics, low information voters, uh, and to be thoughtful about how to reach them. Uh, and then obviously registration targets, turnout targets, uh, as many of those people as possible you want to turn into volunteers and activists. Uh, and I just thought you guys were doing really innovative work. You had hired a lot of people, both from politics, but from the private sector. And quite frankly, I've learned a lot more uh, than you've learned from me uh, in, in these last couple of years. So it's been a real joy because politics, you know, you're right. I got into politics a long time ago and we had like mimeograph machines and pagers, okay? And, and the scale of the change in politics, it's just advancing every cycle. And I think those of us that have been involved in politics for a long time really need to understand um, that those who uh, have a better understanding of how to run today's races and tomorrow's races need to have the seats of power. So yeah, I retired in politics after 2012. I think for a lot of people, um, a lot of people I'm sure on this uh, Zoom seminar did everything they could in 16 and more. I wasn't one of them. And so it was, what, what could I do uh, to help get rid of the menace in, in the office? And I really thought that this was the most important presidential election since Abraham Lincoln's, uh, both of his elections back in 1860 and 1864. I think everything that's happened since the election only ratifies that. Um, and, you know, for me, um, we dodged the, the worst by getting rid of Trump, uh, but we see uh, that what is going to, what remains is even more insidious. Uh, so you and I often talked about, Tara, that we had to be Trump. That was kind of core to survival. <laughs> But Trumpism, in, in, and it was going to definitely, you cut off the head of the snake, but a bunch of other people are going to try and attach their heads to the snake um, and grow it and take it to new places. And so I think the challenge is uh, Joe Biden ran a great race. He won a decisive electoral college victory. Um, you know, yes, Georgia was close and Wisconsin was close and Arizona was close, but the tipping point state, uh, whether you want to look at that as being Pennsylvania and Michigan, those weren't particularly close. Obviously, he won by millions of votes. But it was still a relatively close race, and I think we should be sober about that. A president uh, who did a, such a terrible job, who's a terrible human being, who was running during a once in a century pandemic that he bungled, uh, and had an economy in deep recession, almost won re-election. And obviously down ballot, we didn't do as well as we wanted to. Now, Trump generates great turnout. Uh, you know, he didn't do as well in 16 as he could have in that regard, because he had a ramshackle campaign. But in 18, Democrats had better turnout, but particularly if you look in red districts and red states, they had pretty good turnout too. And then they blew the doors off turnout in 2020. We did well enough uh, to hang in there. And that's what's so exciting is to see the activism uh, that really emerged um, with intensity, literally in the first hours after Trump was inaugurated in, in 2017, carry on for four years. And that's why we won. It was heroic work by so many people around the country. Um, but that's gonna have to continue. Um, and so I think that's the scary thing. I think for everybody that poured their heart and soul into winning back the House in 18, winning back state houses, then getting rid of Trump, um, the work's just beginning because there's gonna be more coup attempts. If we have a close presidential election in 2024 that let's say comes down to a state, less than 10,000 votes, uh, and we're on top of that, we could very well lose it. Uh, the voter suppression activities are obviously happening uh, already. Uh, and, and what's complicated about this is we have the traditional Republican and Democratic fights about the size of government, tax rates, health care coverage, what to do about climate change or not. But we also now have an added battle of autocracy versus democracy. And, you know, Kevin McCarthy, uh, the insurrectionist in chief, uh, the House Minority Leader, was in Florida yesterday meeting with Donald Trump. So we know what's going to happen here going forward. Uh, is the battle lines are only going to be, I think, more drawn and more important. And I think that's scary for everybody because we'd like a little bit of a break. <laughs> and I think last thing I'll say is uh, if this work only happens around the election, um, George is a great example of that. Um, we're going to not be successful. So what I like to do in a presidential race, we've got 22 in front of us, and I'm sure we'll talk about that, is where's the electoral college both going naturally and where you can accelerate trends in your uh, favor and where can you slow down trends that aren't in your favor? So we know that we've got to have Arizona and Georgia, uh, not just part of the conversation, but core battleground states that hopefully lean Democratic in 24. We've got to figure out uh, how to um, still have the upper Midwest be winnable. And I think that's going to get harder 
over time just because of demographic shifts. And then you see what happened in Miami-Dade County, what happened around uh, the border in Texas. Um, those were unique in some instances to those places, but even in some rural areas in the Carolinas, we've got to figure out how to turn um, what happened around a little bit. Because I think I'd go along with the Democratic Party's future uh, with suburban voters. And I think that's one of our core challenges is how do we lock in what we saw in 18 and 20? And that's a core Republican challenge to try and soften that up a little bit. Um, I wouldn't go along on the Republicans' ability to suddenly get reliably 40% of the Hispanic vote nationally uh, or you know, get 20% of the vote with African-American voters, but they're gonna try. Uh, and we better treat those communities as swing voters, not as base voters, something I think you uh, believe in strongly. So what got me off the sidelines is what got everybody off the sidelines or to intensify uh, sort of the existential threat Donald Trump presented. Uh, but I think we're all gonna have to stay in the fight because I think that it, it's only gonna take one bad election for us for literally our democracy to go away. I mean, that's the thing that I think is striking to all of us. Our constitution uh, has weakness in it. If you've got a party, and particularly when they've got leaders who are willing to poke it and prod it and find its weaknesses. Uh, and if you're willing to go to its furthest extremes, um, it can topple. And so when Barack Obama, I think, scared the shit out of everybody during his convention speech um, in, 20, uh, in the Democratic convention uh, in August, when he talked about democracies can wither. Uh, and you think, really, here in America? But I think everything we've seen prior to the election after suggests that, yeah, and it's still an active and present and clear threat. That's absolutely right. And there's so many threads there I want to pick up on. Um, and uh, I think something that I have started to reflect on a great deal um, now that I've had a little bit of time to do some reflection is that, you know, the only reason um, that I started acronym uh, was because things weren't really getting done the way that they needed to, in my perspective, in the party and in the movement in terms of understanding how the ecosystem had changed, not just the political environment and climate. We, we all saw that coming, but actually the media ecosystem and, and, and just the information uh, environment. Um, because we live in such a decentralized distributed media environment right now and everybody is self-selecting, there, there really wasn't any real resources being put behind that. And because of the way that political campaigns and parties operate, there isn't the ability to amass a lot of resources outside of political advertising and cycle to really try to solve complex problems about how we actually evolve our playbook and our strategies and our tactics. And that made me terribly nervous because we saw the threat and didn't see a lot of, of the tactical side of that coming in 2016, I believed, and that we couldn't afford to, to be in that same place again for 2020. And it was why I started acronym, but I also don't know um, that I would have been able to start acronym or recruit someone like you to help me in the team or the resources we needed to run the programs we ran if it weren't for Trump, frankly, right? Because he, he really did scare the shit out of a lot of people that did not think that that was possible. People on our side, people even on the Republican side, people in the middle, donors, what have you. And it brought so much energy and resources into our party. And we saw such incredible um, innovation and, and, and just new energy on the grassroots side with groups like Indivisible and Swing Left, as well as on kind of the more media and tactical and IE side. And, and something that I am deeply nervous about and, and taking myself an acronym out of the picture, but is just because everybody is so tired, we did just hang on by a thread, but by a fraying thread, and people exerted more resources in terms of their time and their energy and their money these past four years, that now is the time to not take the foot off the gas. It's the time to put it, to keep it on, um, to be able to actually win back the state houses we have not won, to be able to shore up the House and Senate because they are also hanging by a thread for us. And will people have the will? to do it. And I think that I am still a little bit cynical and pessimistic and worried. And so um, I guess my question to you is how do we keep everyone engaged from the donors that never gave politically ever who started to write seven figure checks that were mission critical to the individuals who'd never been engaged at all in their communities who started joining text message banks um, to be able to help support Democrats up and down the ballot. 
Well, we could talk about this question for literally, Tara, uh, a whole year because there's so many parts of it. But I think you're right. And we should understand how exhausted people are. Uh, and so people are going to have to pace themselves and decide how to get more active. But I think I think, um, you know, we just have to, first of all, good storytelling about what the activism meant, about what the contribution meant, I think is important. As close as this election was, as close as some of these states were in the presidential, nobody can argue that if they volunteered even 10 or 15 hours in a state like Arizona or Georgia, they didn't play a role uh, in that result. Um, I think good candidates matter, you know, because the truth is people don't volunteer for a party. You know, I mean, some people do, but most people, they get inspired by somebody or set of candidates, right? And one of the things that was so exciting about 2018 on election night, when you saw race being called and race being called for Democrats, these were just exciting, normal people, you know, uh, who were just great people. Most of them hadn't spent decades in politics. And that's great. I hope we will see more of that. I think that's the question. In 22 and 24 and 26, are we going to see the same type of people running for district attorney offices and state legislature and mayor? Uh, if, if not, I think we're going to struggle. And will the activists stay with it? We saw in 18 enormous activism. We saw in 20 enormous activism. And to me, there's a couple of threshold questions in American politics today. One, Trump was able to generate great turnout. Um, how much of that carries on with him not on the ballot? We saw a little slippage in 18, but not everywhere. Uh, and then certainly he drove great turnout in 2020. Um, how much of that is able to be replicated? How much can the Democratic Party and their candidates hold on to the turnout and activism we saw? If there's a lopsided answer to that question, one side or the other, that side's going to dominate in 2022. Uh, I think in 2024, because it's a presidential year, you're more likely to see more something like parity or close to it. But you could see a lopsided. We've often seen that uh, in off year elections. Um, and then, listen, we got to look at, you know, the House. When redistricting was done in the beginning of the last decade, so the, you know in 2012, most House experts thought there was no way Democrats could ever win the House back. Surprised everybody with 18, but we did win a lot of tough seats. And what we see is when then you saw a presidential year turn out at a bunch of those seats, some of our great candidates weren't able to withstand that. So it's not going to get any better likely after redistricting. So you know it's not like we have a super high watermark in the House. And then the Senate, as we know. Probably the natural state of things, because we used to have senators in both Dakotas, had all four of them, actually, uh, in Louisiana and Arkansas. There's less states where we have Democratic senators, and I think plausibly could expect to win. So probably the natural state, we're probably close to a high watermark. Maybe we could get up to 52, 53. So we don't have a Senate seat to waste. And there were some ones in the last election that were stretches. I mean, Iowa. Uh, you know, uh, Doug Jones, you know, who, who won that remarkable race the first time, those were going to be tough races. Losing North Carolina and Maine were real blows, I think. So as we look at this time, the Pennsylvanias, the North Carolinas, the Wisconsins, you got to win all those uh, or certainly go down trying. Uh, and we can't lose any of our incumbents in places like, uh, you know, Nevada and, and New Hampshire. So it's going to require everybody because it's not like we're sitting on some natural advantage. And it's particularly important in off years. You know, in July of 21, uh, you know, for people to get involved, uh, whether that's doing, you know, text banking, uh, door knocking when we can do that, giving money. I always remember back in both 2009 and 13 after Obama's two wins, people would always say, you know, guys, you guys were really good at messaging during the campaigns. Why do you suck so much now? And we definitely did some things wrong. But it's like, imagine what a billion dollars in a condensed period can do for your message effectiveness. A lot. You know, Joe Biden doesn't have that right now. You know, the Senate Democrats don't have that right now. Uh, and so they're very reliant on the old playbook. So that's the other thing I think, you know, Tara, why I was so excited with what you were doing and, and there's some other groups doing this as well is, you know, I came up at a time in politics when you think about, um, let's say you're going to unveil your next healthcare plan. You think about the speech you're going to give, which reporter you're going to give an exclusive to, the background briefing your experts give with the press. Maybe you have a television ad, you do a TV, like that's all still important. But that's got to be secondary to what's the meme, what's the gif, what's the quick video you're going to do on TikTok and Instagram. And if you're not thinking that way, you're not going to reach enough people today. Uh, and so that's where I think the old ways can still be part of the playbook, but, but every cycle they need to be a decreasing part of the playbook. And I, that's one of the things I'm encouraged to buy, uh, both you and your team and some others out there, you know, at least we're thinking more consistently with, you know, through the prism of this device, you know, that's, you've got to think through that. And that's hard for people, I think, who've done politics uh, the other way. But we have to keep people engaged because I think that there is going to be some fallout from people. We saw that in the Georgia elections. It didn't take 
a lot, but there was enough people who said, wait, Trump's saying it was rigged and Lynn Wood's saying it's rigged, so why should I bother voting? But there's going to be a lot more people who stick with it on their side. Uh, we have to understand that. Um, and, and that's what it's going to require. Uh, because if we have a bad 22, um, and listen, the House majority is obviously quite thin. The Senate majority couldn't be any thinner. We didn't do as well in state houses. Uh, it takes a long time to dig out of a bad uh, election that's the first in a redistricting cycle. So they're all important, but 22 is probably going to be the most important one of the decade because it sets the stage for so much. So, so, but I think, again, people aren't going to continue to volunteer and give their time and their treasure uh, if they don't see positive results. And that's why I think every organization out there and all of us that are involved need to celebrate things that matter in people's lives. Uh, and there's a lot just in the first week with Joe Biden to do that. But we have to basically say, not that it's payback because people don't expect that, but look, the things you care about are happening all the time you spent away from your family, the money you gave that was really hard to give, particularly during the pandemic, uh, it was worth it because things are changing. And so I think you've got to understand, and that's challenging because in the last week, can I, and I pay more uh, close attention to this than most people, can I name you everything that's been done by Joe Biden uh, in the last week? I really can't. So there's a lot of it. So we have to take our time, I think, to do some storytelling around the accomplishments. It's super important. I, I certainly think in the Obama years, we didn't do enough of that. Yeah, and I do, I think that there are also, there are so many people that came in and that worked their butts off and poured all of their hearts and souls in every sort, in any kind of way, whether they were just organizing in their communities or they were a creative uh, producer or artist, et cetera, that gave their time to, we had uh, wake up and vote on earlier um, and our, our friends over there who, who really galvanized the creative community and task force and all of these amazing groups. And they, they have not, um, they got involved also after Trump came in and a lot of folks did. And so honestly, they have more energy than I do. <laughs> and I, I want to keep that going, right? They weren't also doing, um, you know, campaigns for years and years before that. And so there is a lot of new energy to be able to keep, but we need to have the resources to do it. And so I do want to talk about money. I know that we have some funders here. I know that we at Acronym have a reputation, which is fair, that we raised and deployed a lot of money. Um, that was a great privilege that we took very seriously um, because we needed that level of resources to be able to run the programs we did at scale. Media is very expensive. Other tactics may be less so. But what I am, what I am really fixated on right now is how... How can we change the culture in our politics around funding and resourcing these efforts and these individuals and these, and these communities that do have the energy and do want to keep doing the work and don't have the relationships you and I might have, but also how do we change the culture around investing in infrastructure? Because for all of the change and the additional resources energy that came in because of Trump, I saw a lot of things that didn't change and, and had a lot of conversations with people and still to to this day that I don't think that they really believe it needs to in certain ways. And I don't think that um, I'm just very concerned that if we don't shift that culture, we are going to find ourselves in the same position that you and all of us found ourselves in in 2010, um, where the pendulum swung because the money will all come late because people feel tired or burnt out. And so so the efforts will be deployed late. The lessons won't get applied soon enough to have an impact because everything we learned and talked about today might not be as relevant in six months. I mean, we might not have uh, a lot of digital political ads anymore. And, and we're already thinking about evolving that. And so a, a very long winded way of saying, you know, things still really need to change at the structural level and at the party leader level. And I don't mean the individuals, but I mean the conversation and the culture and what it takes to actually bring things like the innovation we brought at our organization and others have into the space. And frankly, a lot of those efforts wouldn't have been possible without new people with new resources who took a very different and less risk um, averse approach to this work. And so I, I'm just curious how you think about, you've been in this world longer than I have to see it not change as quickly as it needs to. Um, you know, what you would say to folks like that who, who have always given in a cyclical way, um, and then you know maybe been surprised or not understood why 
things again flipped back? Like, are we just supposed to believe it? That's just the pendulum swing or is there more we can do? Because I do believe that there is more that we can be doing now. Yeah, well, so I'd say first, whether it's somebody who might have the resources to contribute, um, you know, six or seven figures to this work or somebody who's just thinking about, um, you know, $10 or $25, uh, you know, that's incredibly hard for him. I do think, or her, I think Tara, what we've seen since the election is going to help atmospherically. Yeah, there is some people I think are like, Trump's gone, I've done my work, I can move on. But you see the insurrection, the attempted coup, uh, all the insiders, Trump, Cruz, Hawley, McCarthy, trying to dodge any accountability. Basically from day one, most in Congress on the Republican side saying they're not going to help Biden on COVID. Uh, McConnell basically trying to pretend like he didn't lose the Senate. Like, they're not going to change. They're only going to get worse. So this should be motivation for people to understand the fight goes on. OK. Um, and I think it, it is a great question. I, I think, listen, I couldn't be more excited that Jer Jamie Harrison is the DNC chair. There'll be good work done at the two campaign committees for Senator House. But most of the infrastructure work isn't going to be done at those entities. It is going to be done by groups. And that can be frustrating for donor donors. I think some donors I talked to would like, just tell me one place to give my resources and I can be done with it. But some people are organizing in Georgia, some people are organizing in Texas, uh, you know, Courier, the properties you have that are doing great uh, local storytelling in places like Virginia and Arizona is different. So, but it's the landscape, but I think that's what we have to remind people. So you saw in Georgia, that wouldn't have happened uh, without the infrastructure, without the, the money and the organizing happening off Broadway, not, you know, two months before the election. Even though we didn't win Texas electoral votes, we continue to see the right kind of movement electorally. We've got to stick at that. I mean, Texas is probably a checkmate state for us if we could ever get that in our column. So, you know, keeping Georgia, keeping Arizona, putting Texas in play. I've been part of efforts to win Florida twice. I'm not ready to give up on Florida. I think there's a lot of work that can be done in that state uh, to certainly get it back to a, a place where races are decided by a half a point. Uh, and we can win more of those than we lose if we put the infrastructures. All those, by the way, are big states. They're complicated states. So there's storytelling that's part of that. There's data that's part of that. There's organizing that's part of that. Uh, but if we just rely on basically great candidates uh, coming around, who can kind of make magic happen in the last three to four months of an election, we're going to not like the outcome more often than not. And we have to understand where our politics is. The right has huge advantages. They have an ecosystem that is effective and dominant and consistent. Prager University, Breitbart, Fox, obviously, Sinclair, they've got it all, okay? And they are pumping out consistent, compelling messages every day. We don't have the same thing. Uh, so that's a huge disadvantage. And sometimes we can compete with that in a campaign. We're not in a campaign right now. So think about what's gonna happen this year when if there's not enough organizing and storytelling and creative work happening to tell our story, but it's happening on the other side. That's how you create a dispirited base on our side or a disinterested base. Uh, and the other side, uh, as rapid as they were under Trump. So, and, and this is a closely divided country. The presidential race was close, the Senate's 50-50. Again, I think the Republicans probably have a higher ceiling in the Senate in today's politics than we do. So we can't lose a, we can't waste a single Senate race. The House right now is super close and it, it could get more challenging after redistricting. Uh, so much of our support uh, is uh, concentrated in urban areas. We're starting to see our ability to really win majorities in suburban areas. And that's why we won the House in large part in 18. But you know, the Republican advantages in a lot of state houses in the US House because they are winning rural and exurban seats, let's say 60, 40, um, you know, that used to be more competitive. So uh, this infrastructure work is absolutely critical and they have such built-in advantages on the other side that by the way, Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell don't control that. You know, the people who control the Republican party now are not those two. Uh, you know, McConnell's got parliamentary power, but you know, let, what's the party gonna be like uh, the Republican party over the next two or four years? Don't ask a single elected official. It's about Rupert Murdoch. It's about Lachlan Murdoch. It's about the people that run Sinclair. It's Tucker Carlson. It's Laura Ingram. Uh, it's Sean Hannity. And we see the answers already out. They stood by Trump as he tried to bring our country to his knees. Um, and, and that's only going to intensify. So there's a lot of discussion about the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Lauren Bobertsville world right now. They are clearly more of the short-term future of the Republican Party than Mitt Romney or Ben Sass. 
That's just reality, okay? And ultimately, I think they'll pay a political price for that. Uh, but, but that's where we are right now. And so, so the organizing that has to be done to make sure we can more consistently than not win Georgia at the statewide level, more consistently than we not win Arizona. We can't give up Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, I would say ever, but, but certainly until Texas and Florida are able to replace them. So, um, and that's important, not just for the presidential race, but for those gubernatorial races, Senate races, and House races. So, so that hard work, voter registration, um, recruiting volunteers, listening, I mean, important thing we clearly have to do, Tara, so much of the interesting journalism that's been done in my mind, um, both in areas where Biden and Democrats did really well, was, was very illuminating about why that was, but also where uh, we didn't hit our marks in Miami-Dade County and along the border in South and West Texas. Uh, and it's going to start with listening, which is how can we get some of these voters back so we can get the kind of win numbers we need. That's exactly right. And but I'd be it, curious. You, I mean, I'd be curious. You mentioned, I mean, obviously, you started acronym. Uh, back in the 18 cycle, um, but decided this time to really uh, intensify, um, you know, a program around the presidential race, just kind of what were the barriers you ran into, um, you know, to get this launched and, and have it funded properly? Where do you start? How many targets on our back? Um, uh, so many barriers, but also, you know, I, I, I feel incredibly lucky um, that that we got we get to do this work that I get to do this work and that we were able to do it at this scale and I really do credit that um, yeah. to people like you who believed in it and said this is necessary and validated it because validation is really important. Um, politics is a shark tank, no matter what side you're in. Um, but also, so many of the donors that frankly took a very different approach than a lot of folks that have been giving politically for years and years, and we're grateful for that. But they have a different method and a different perspective on, on what they fund and why. And, and really we relied heavily on a lot of individuals who were more willing and comfortable to take risks because they knew that something had to change. They knew that, that, that if we weren't going to change our approach, we shouldn't expect a different result. And so they invested in new leaders and new strategies. And that was, that was the only reason we were able um, to build our organization and our amazing team as quickly as we did, retain the talent that we could and do what we did. Um, I will say though that I, you know, I wrote uh, a very long white paper with some members of my team back in 2017 about the need to be able to build progressive media infrastructure. And I, I pitched it as if we took 1% of the billions of dollars that are spent on paid advertising every cycle, and we put it into media infrastructure in the ground in states and we were honest and we and we but we but we were also unapologetically progressive because we don't have a counterweight to the right wing media that spreads disinformation in this country because the elite media does not meet people where they are uh, in between the coasts. They really don't. They haven't evolved their marketing or their outreach strategies or their business models to do that. So we are just leaving the vast majority of America to disinformation online. And I wrote this memo in 2017 about how if we just took 1% of that money that is spent on paid advertising and television each cycle, we could build a massive infrastructure. And I think that appealed to like three people at the time. Thankfully, mm -hmm. two of them were had the resources to help me start to build that infrastructure. But I was adamant, and this was uh, not long before you and I met and started talking, that I was not going to get engaged in the presidential program in a super PAC way, the way that we did, if there was not infrastructure being built with some of that resources that could continue to do this work and communicate to voters year round. I have no interest in continuing to run these cycles and try to make progress and then see it all slide back because the money leaves, the energy leaves, and the communication to voters leaves. And then we wonder why they support progressive policies and ballot measures like $15 minimum wage in Florida, but don't vote for a single Democrat on their ticket. Outside of that, we do have a brand problem, but it's not about a rebrand campaign the DNC needs to do. It is about communicating to voters every single day, year round, about what their government, what their elected officials are doing for them or not. So the first time they hear who their house rep is, who their state rep is, who their senator is, is not through negative ads on their television and on their Facebook feeds in cycle. And meanwhile, if we're not doing that, the only thing they are hearing in between election cycles with political dollars 
is the offensive narratives coming from the right, that we are radical socialists, that immigrants are taking your jobs, that, you know, that all of the things, I don't need to rehash them, everybody on this call knows them, but we're not competing with those narratives right now. And so I just think that there has to be a culture change, there has to be a funding change. And you mentioned that we're not in election right now. I would argue, yes, we absolutely are. 2022 started the day after 2020 ended and it dragged on. But if we don't understand that we now are in a position to actually have real wins that are going to end this pandemic through the work that Biden and the Senate and Congress have the opportunity to do right now to to put relief in people's hands, to 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 pass paid leave for all of the parents that now uh, understand how the majority of parents in this country have been dealing with having to pay for child care with low wage jobs. We can do that now, but if we don't actually tell the American people that that is being done and who is responsible for it and who is trying to obstruct it in real time, do we deserve the power we have? And so I think that that's, the, the, when we talk about infrastructure, it sounds like a really unsexy word. That's what it means. It means communicating year round and it doesn't need to be at the expense level of campaigns. It actually just means that we actually have to inform the American people because we can't rely on anyone else to do it for us. So I, I would say that yeah. we got through a lot of barriers to do short-term work, to be able to drive this innovation and learning, but it's going to take a hell of a lot more time and money to be able to kind of really turn this ship around. Otherwise, to your earlier point, yeah. it'll just be one more election before it's all gone. Yeah, I think, you know, we have, if you look at the last 20 years, we've had some really great election cycles and challenging ones, but for the most part, you know, when we get into that election window, right now, in some states, that could be a year of advertising. In some cases, it's two months. But, you know, we're able to compete better because we're out there reaching the people we need to reach with the messages. When the election's over, um, that all goes away and the right infrastructure doesn't. So you have to understand. And that's important. Yes, for some swing voters, if all they see is the lies and misinformation from the right. Um, that could cost us with them, but it's also important for folks who volunteered or gave money. If they don't see any local coverage in their state about what Biden's doing or their senator is doing, their member of house doing, I wonder like what's going on, right? And we know from our research that there's there's both a content problem. We don't have enough just good content that's not political advertising. That's just news, particularly local news, local information. I know you guys at Courier are really thinking digital first now, so less thousand paid word articles, but more. Um, you know, uh, you know, infographics and, and visuals that tell a story. But there's both the lack of that, but then there's a last mile problem, which is, as we know from all the work in 2020, one of the amazing findings I know you talked about earlier was just the effectiveness of boosted news. Stories that exist out there that aren't advertising, so they are more real to people, therefore more effective, that they're not seeing. Uh, and so if you have more content that is meaningful, both for swing voters, but also for activists and, and base Democrats. And we've got a good flywheel about how to get that in front of them. Um, you know, that's how we begin to fight back a little bit. But with the absence of that, um, you basically have, uh, you know, Joe Biden and Senate Democrats and House Democrats and even state legislative leaders kind of speaking through an antiquated uh, megaphone, which is not reaching the people we need to reach. While on their side, they, they never take a day off. They never take a second off. Uh, and that's what we have to understand. So I, you're right. I mean, obviously, organizing is part of the infrastructure we need to build voter registration, um, fighting off these efforts to reduce vote by mail uh, and early voting, uh, which we're going to see, I think, in an insidious way this year. Uh, but this communication day in and day out. Um, and listen, I've helped a lot of people through the years get elected to various offices. Uh, and that's always been a challenge is even when you win and you run a good campaign, all of that goes away and you're left at the whims of earned media. Uh, and that's challenging uh, when you are solely dependent on that, when the other side is not. And that's been the case for about 25 years now. And the media, the media's honeymoon with Joe Biden is over, by the way. <laughs> so it's not as though suddenly- Well, as it should be, that's not their role. Yes, okay? exactly. Despite what the right it's, thinks, right? Exactly, but that yeah. means again, we just can't rely, we can't, we can't believe that the information, even if it is accurate, is going to get the American people. We are all way too awake and smart for that now. 74 million people voted for Trump, to your point. He is not going anywhere, but also Trumpism is not going anywhere. And, and that was not the last breath 
whatsoever. This is going to be an, an incredibly difficult uphill climb. Um, I don't want to stay uh, so negative. I want to be able to get um, to some folks' questions about this. Um, I do want to mention, because you and I have talked a lot about this in the past, about content and about content creation. And I know that I have a ton of experience as you in ads and advertising. And we talked a ton about advertising today for everybody who's been listening. But what I am probably most excited and hopeful about, about the changing media ecosystem, and there aren't many things to be very candid. But one thing is, is that it is so distributed right now and younger generations have grown up on these platforms where they are content creators. And it isn't actually about poll testing a message and then making a lot of fancy creative. That's great. We want that. That's icing. That's icing, right? It is actually about individuals being the best and most trusted messengers for the people in their lives and their communities and using these platforms to do that. And I think that's the energy I don't want to see go away. And I don't think we will. I don't think TikTok suddenly is not going to have any civics or political content from these really young people because they're so hyper engaged. And I do believe that there is a feeling we need to we need to keep reminding everyone of that we actually really did make change, right? We we saw it almost slip away and it changed and it, you know, we didn't get the 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 landslide or the mandate that we need and there's so much work to do, but that means we can build from that and you don't need um, to run an organization as large as acronym or or to have the relationships that we have to be able to actually just make that change through your own stories and storytelling. And the best thing that other groups can do is lift those stories up where they can find those individuals and really do focus on that communications year round to humanize and localize politics. Because I think that's something political ads don't do. They, they have the adverse effect of that, I think, to a lot of people in this country. So I just I wanted to put that uh, out there because I know right. you feel similarly. Yeah, no, I mean, somebody just, you know, speaking out of their phone has been some of the most effective content over the last couple of election cycles uh, and some of the most effective content in the aftermath of the insurrection. Uh, you know, people talking about, uh, you know, voting rights attacks uh, in Georgia and elsewhere. So, yeah, no. But then the question is, so I still think we need more content. I am excited about that. There's just citizens creators out there who are putting together content that can reach millions of people. But we have to have the ability with, you know, surgical precision and knowledge and good data to understand who needs to see that sort of stuff to turbocharge it. Uh, and I think that is exciting. I think the old model of, you know, you do a poll and you run a nicely produced ad and that's your main message anymore. Um, you know, that's kind of background noise. We all like to see them to your point. Um, you know, some of the Lincoln Project ads and some of the Biden ads were great and I'm sure they were effective, but it is, uh, you know, so, so for instance, in the last week, you know, you've seen videos of some younger people in particular who said, I got involved in the election. I wasn't even that excited about Biden, but we just got back into Paris and I'm really excited. Right. So like that, that 15 seconds reaches, you know, a lot of people who might stay in politics now because they saw that message. So it's, it's so powerful and, and exhilarating to see that happening uh, more and more often. We just have to keep folks engaged when it gets hard <laughs> because there will be mistakes. No administration or president is perfect. And we, we don't have a super majority in Congress. So we, we do need to keep fighting and keep our eye on the prize, which is not letting our government slip back. Uh, to the powers that almost took it over. So I, I do want to take some questions for folks because we just have a little over 10 minutes. Um, so I, I'm just going to read some of these and then David, you and I can both um, chime in. But okay, so many progressives in the communications industry have been frustrated by how readily the GOP and its right-wing media machine has successfully painted brand Democrats as socialist, radical, et cetera. Do you think Jamie Harrison and the DNC can retake the reins of its brand and can currently tie the GOP for what it has become? Are the Democrats just too pluralistic to rally around a shared branding initiative? I think about this all the time, but I'm curious your take. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, you know, they have infrastructure advantages. We've talked about that from Fox on down. But I think Democrats, from my perspective, always oversell the brilliance of Republican messaging. They lose a lot of freaking elections, okay, despite that infrastructure advantage, okay? I mean, it wasn't just 2020 that they talk about socialism. Hell, I was running Senate races back in the 90s, and that was the main attack, okay? So, like, we've seen this for a long time. Um, uh, so, I think, I'm not sure I want necessarily a consistent brand or a rebrand, right? I think it is more, um, we've got good values. We've got good things we're doing for people. 
But if you don't tell anybody about them, uh, people are going to know about them and they're going to get cynical. Uh, again, both swing voters as well as, you know, activists and turnout targets. Um, so I think that um, consistency is good. And so I think, you know, when you're talking about debates in Washington, you have most Democrats saying the same thing with the same language, you know, kind of aimed at the same target. That's effective. I think we could definitely be better there. And I think that can be effective. Um, but, you know, the Republican brand is a mess as well. Uh, we've seen great flight, uh, both in exurbs and suburban areas. So let's not treat them as, you know, the best political messages of all time, because um, they lose a lot of elections, including elections they uh, shouldn't lose uh, through the years. I mean, the truth is, if you look at the last decade, you know, they gave away a lot more Senate races than we did. The ones that we didn't win are painful. There's no doubt about that. And again, I think we probably have a bigger burden right now, but they lost a lot of Senate races they probably should have won. Um, but I think for us, um, we just have to be, um, we're be oh, everybody always asks me again, you know, whether it's a Senate race or a governor's race or a president's race, God, you know, you had good message and you were aggressive and you're effective in the campaign. Then you get in office and you suck. Well, all those resources go away if you don't have consistent, persistent infrastructure that's helping you tell your story. And again, their infrastructure doesn't go away. You know, Fox, Breitbart, Sinclair, Prager University, all of these things are spending the same amount of money they are today that they did in October. And they're just going to spend more. And that's the way it is. Uh, and so I think we have to understand that. So um, to me, um, we have more of an infrastructure problem uh, than a message problem. Now, there's no question for us as a party, if we want to get back to the point where we could ever have 55 senators again, or, you know, win and control the house comfortably and win back more state houses, we have to find a way to get more competitive and exurbed in rural areas. That doesn't mean somehow we trim our sales. Uh, you know, good candidates, good parties uh, can excite a 19 year old woman of color, but also convince, you know, a 62 year old iron worker in exurban Wisconsin to come back home. So we have to do that. But, but that is where the infrastructure we've talked to, I talked about Miami-Dade and the border in Texas, yes. But we also have to think about what kind of infrastructure, and a lot of this comes down to storytelling, needs to happen in exurban areas. And by the way, we can't take our suburban gains for granted. You gotta treat those gains as if they're precious and go away as well. But in rural and exurban areas, if we could just get four or five points back, a lot changes then uh, in terms of state houses and the House of Representatives. And politics has changed a lot. I mean, again, when you look at the maps of even 10 or 15 years ago, the House districts we held, the Senate uh, you know, seats that we held, they're almost inconceivable for young people coming from politics. Why? You had four senators in the Dakotas? You had senators in Arkansas uh, and Louisiana? Uh, and it wasn't too long ago. So for us, uh, that doesn't mean that you would trade competitiveness in those areas for the strength we just saw in Georgia. We need to be able to do both. Uh, so to me, it, it's you can always improve your messaging, but I think it's, it's, it's being more aggressive and persistent outside of campaign windows uh, to take advantage of the fact that on most issues and on questions of both values and advocacy, Democrats enjoy an advantage. We just do. We see even with, the, you know, the polling questions around what Biden's trying to do on some of these questions now, you know, he's got two thirds to 70 uh, percent is that, now that is higher than candidate selection. So there's a delta there. And I think a lot of work needs to go on to to, to limit that delta. That's exactly right. So I, I want to take a few more questions because we have a lot on organizing. And I think that's so important. Can we keep the momentum going by investing in year round on the ground organizing? Can we expand and or create organizations like the New Georgia Project to operate 365 days a year all over the country? Um, I'll, I want to take part of this one, and then David, you can chime in if you have more to add. But I, when when we talk about infrastructure, that is not just media infrastructure. That is a huge part of it. But when we talk about storytelling, that's not just media infrastructure either. Infrastructure is this work being done year round. That is what my, I mean, at least when I talk about infrastructure, it means the resources to do the work that we do in election cycles year round to communicate to organize to engage people in their communities and keep them engaged because we know now that when you stop any of and all of that work and they don't we are starting from behind again when our resources come in and i think that this is a problem and a challenge at every level of our current infrastructure 
which means like the biggest bodies of funding and collectives of money. And I think that there are some incredibly um, disruptive and new groups that are challenging that and engaging um, donors and funders of all levels in different ways to stay engaged. I think Way to Win did incredible work at, at driving resources around different states and communities and women and BIPOC led organizations. And I hope that that continues year round and that their funders are that, because I do think it, it's a culture change that has to happen in our politics. So we do not start from scratch. And I also think that there's something to be said about ROI. If you are willing to spend significant sums in election cycle and then withdraw until the next election cycle, you are not getting a strong ROI. Imagine if you spend less consistently year round on the groups that you think do a fantastic job at organizing or the media organizations that are, that are, that are actually reporting and covering politics in a local and human and culturally relevant way for people year round. In theory, the case is you don't have to spend as much on all of that work in a cycle because you're not starting from scratch. And so I really do think that it is, it's a culture change and the organizing is, is equally if not more important, but I really do think the two go in tandem. Narrative comes at the ground level in organizing door to door, text message to text message, post to post, as well as the cover that we need to actually be tying together an overarching narrative that, that puts them on the defense as one, at once, as we did with COVID um, and haven't with many other narratives. I think that's so important. Um, Let's say that you had a huge amount of money to invest in progressive politics. <laughs> Maybe you bought some game stuff. Very, very relevant. Um, where, where would you recommend putting that money now to help us continue winning the future, David? And I give you the right to not say acronym or courier. <laughs> where well, would you advise people cur- to go? You know, courier and, and, and other efforts that might emerge that are doing just consistent, great storytelling. A day in and day out, regardless of whether we're quote unquote in election cycle, not important. But you know, groups like um, you know the New Georgia Project, Battleground Texas. I'm not going to name them, but but to the previous question, I can guarantee to you, no one in Washington D.C. knows how to organize South Texas, okay, uh, or uh, you know make Arizona a point or two more Democratic, or uh, make sure that we can make the gains throughout Florida to make that a core battleground state. It's gonna come from the local level. So this can't be like Jamie Harrison's problem. I mean, he needs to identify these groups and help them with money, but it's gonna be groups, entrepreneurs basically, who emerge at the local level that all of us need to support and fund. And the types, think about it. So today, all throughout these core states that matter to the House and Senate and presidential, kids are turning 18. Are they getting today a message to register to vote? A lot of states now, if you're 17, you can pre-register. Are we asking them in off years to do that? Um, everybody that volunteered in, in Georgia, you know, I'm sure they're getting messages that saying like the minimum wage has now been introduced in this possibility because we delivered the White House. But, but other states, that's not happening. So part of it is got to report back to the people who gave their sweat and their treasure and their time that it was all worth it. But that organizing has to be day in and day out or else you just fall into deficit. We just got to be on it. So I think there's a lot of state groups that are doing great organizing work. More will emerge. There's a lot of great groups focused on identifying great candidates to run. That is so important because, again, somebody's going to give you 10 hours a week or $10 they can't afford to give because they're excited by the candidate first, party second. And so that's been so exciting to see groups like Courier. So uh, but I think that um, we've seen we have some good models out there now um, about what's possible. Uh, Georgia being um, the most, I think, exciting one. Um, And I can tell you that was what what was pulled off in Georgia, that trifecta is just an incredible feat of modern politics. Okay, Uh, you know, Georgia is trending uh, and so many great activists down there and Stacey Abrams with her leadership and and Mayor Bottoms, I mean, basically accelerated it uh, and maximized. But even then we see how close it is. Uh, So, so, you know, the question is for me, when I look back at 2008, Virginia, you know, Obama wins it for the first time since LBJ. Virginia now is safe blue. You know, I'm sure the governor's race will be competitive, but, you know, uh, North Carolina was, uh, we won it in 08, uh, lost it narrowly in 12. Uh, North Carolina didn't go in that direction. So the question is on Arizona, Anna, Georgia, how do we 
do all we can to make it more of a Virginia story than a North Carolina story. How do we get North Carolina, you know, consistently into that uh, discussion as well? And then these bigger states, um, you know, again, I think uh, just because Trump outperformed expectations in Florida, I mean, Florida is a winnable state for the right Democratic candidate, but it ain't going to happen without the infrastructure. Uh, and that is a, a hairy, probably nine figure problem. But to your point, Tara, like if you look at all the money that's spent the billions and billions and billions of dollars that are spent in the last three to six months, if we could just have a percentage of that smoothed out, and I think that's what we're talking about, how can we have things smoothed out a little bit more smartly so that we can do that kind of investment, uh, so that we can do what it takes to have, again, in politics, whether it's winning back the Senate, winning state houses, the House, um, the presidency, what you're trying to give yourself is a maximum margin for error. <laughs> so you don't have to run the table. That's what this is all about. I mean, I know that's not very romantic. It's about a lot of things, issues and leadership. But from a raw math and electoral standpoint, that's what you're trying to do. And that has to be our mission is how do we put more places in play? Not that we win them all, but we can lose a bunch of them and still win the House and maintain it, win back the presidency, win back the Senate. That's what we have to do. And so, uh, you know, giving to groups that are doing that hard work now when no one's looking, uh, when it's hard work. But the other thing we've learned, I'm sure you guys talked about this, Tara, is in earlier sessions. When you're engaging with a voter or a potential voter, when it's right around the election, it's less effective because they're just hearing all these messages and it seems like you might have an agenda. But if you're actually engaging with them outside of an election cycle, you're going to have a better conversation, a truer conversation. And I think we have to take advantage of those windows. I think that's right. And I know that we are at time. I think one last point I just want to make to folks uh, and donors who might be listening is um, really look at the leaders, the people who did good work um, and that 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 should keep doing that work and don't necessarily wait for them to come back to you because they're worried that it won't make sense until you're ready to give again to um, and and really, you know, don't rely just on the way that things have been because that hasn't worked. Um, Georgia was not a popular investment for all of that field work that has been hard fought year after year after year. It is now, to David, your point, they're trending. That's only because they got wins, but those wins didn't come because of the resources of this cycle. We were one of the biggest spenders in Georgia and we did not spend nearly as much as all of the states that had incredibly diminishing returns and yet still had thin margins. So I, I just urge folks to, to think differently about how they invest in this and also think about the incentives of the individuals who are running the organizations and the initiatives that you're investing in because it matters and you get to choose uh, who and where you put your money to do that. And I think that makes a world of difference. And I think that we saw so much more of that energy and we need to keep it up. So um, David, thank you so much. Um, for joining as we get into our rants and raves in front of an audience. Um, I appreciate it. It's always such a pleasure. And thank you everybody so much for spending so much time with us today. Again, you'll be able to watch any of the sessions today that you missed. They were all excellent on um, acronymplaybook.com. And of course, find us on social. But um, we have a lot We have a lot to build on right now. And we are in a much better place than, than I even expected um, and, and probably let myself hope for. So there is so much to be, um, to be hopeful about and, and just so much work to do to, to carry that forward. But we can't rest on our laurels. So thank you, David. Thank Hi, you, Tara. everybody. Thanks for all you and your team have done. Have and a great we'll night. Be. Yeah.